Hey everyone, and welcome to the this class, the LPS class. Um, today we will be again continuing with the Linux networking uh, lecture number six. Um, in the last uh, lecture, we just introduced the DFS. Today we will be uh, going on uh, with the DFS, the uh, distributed file system. Uh, in fact, I am going to actually we will start the DFS discussion now today. Uh, last time we just looked at some introduction, but I'm going to repeat that um, material again. Um, and uh, before I begin, I think like I mean we had a good lecture on the um, the DNS um, um, system. Uh, we looked at the email last time. Um, I'm not going to recap that uh, today. Um, um, if you have any doubts, you can always take it up uh, in the next uh, session or so. Um, so let's begin the discussion on the distributed file system. Um, again, as I mentioned in the last class, we will talk about the distributed file system, what it entails, why is it a big deal. Uh, we'll go into the architecture uh, again. You need to know like why it's a big deal again. Um, what are the issues with uh, the file system? Um, what are the issues with the file system and um, also um, we will take up like two case studies um, one is on the Sun NFS system and then the other one is uh, Andrew file system um, again um, let us see like I mean how far we can get to but these are the topics that I want to cover. So um, last time we discussed the file system again the file system basically it is it was gen, it was developed for a centralized computer system and the desktop computers and file system is an operational operating system facility providing a convenient programming interface to the disk storage. So we will see like what are the gradations of uh, the file system or we have to understand the memory architecture before we go into the file system. Um, and a distributed file system specifically it supports sharing of information in forms of uh, uh, files and hardware resources across the network so that is the key thing um, and then once we have this uh, distributed object system like Corba or Java and the web this entire thing basically like how much we are sharing and how the sharing happens has become like extremely complex. So um, before we go into the storage system let us look at just the memory architecture I think like I mean this is something that you are familiar with uh, so we have say like I mean this uh, this box represents the op the CPU um, and then there is a cache memory which is part of the CPU which is very very localized and in fact uh, you would not even know the existence un unless you look at the um, the computer itself or basically like what the chip has um, in the control panel or any other place basically. Um, typically these come in various sizes um, right now we have uh, 1 gig 2 gig um, we all measure in, in terms of gig actually. Uh, then we also have uh, the, the main memory uh, this is an example will be like the DDR memory DDR3 is very famous nowadays you get in 2 gig or 4 gig DDRs um, sometimes like even the, the caches like I mean it used to be like in case now probably like in megs and gigs are also available and the memory of course like main memory um, in a heavy duty uh, server it can go all the way up to like uh, 1 terabyte also. Then you have like hard disk which is essentially the, the storage um, um, where things get written and basically uh, uh, it uh, resides the programs reside in the hard disk before they get executed. A distributed storage is nothing but um, so if you look at this particular box the, the box around it is a, is a system or a computer and then basically like a distributed system is a centralized uh, storage and that is shared between multiple of multiple uh, computers or there are multiple disks that can be accessed by a single computer all through a network. 
So now, I mean, if you look at the hard disk and the distributed storage, apparently they are all the similar stuff. So, what is the big deal in like um, using a distributed system? So let's look at some of the challenges. Um, so when we talk about the distributed uh, file systems, um, there are many many challenges that um, that we need to uh, overcome in order to make sure that uh, we get uh, um, we can reliably store and retrieve it. Um, one of the issues is the transparency. Um, so as you know, the data is written in various chunks, basically. So what kind of data in a hard disk is um, transparent to the host systems? Is it all of them? Is it some portions are transparent to some of the systems and some portions are transparent to another system? How is that divided? And then when there is an overlap, like what happens? So these are some of the things that we need to worry about because there are many many systems accessing the same uh, disk storage. Um, so again, that's one thing that we will talk about. Then the next issue will be the concurrency issue. Um, what happens if um, two servers or two clients access the same files concurrently? Who gets the preference and why? So these are the kind of questions that we ask about concurrency. Then the other one is uh, replication, which is when the server, the file in a server changes, can all the clients see the change immediately, or do they have to wait? How will, how does that work? So again, that's another thing that we will uh, talk about. Then the fourth uh, challenge is the heterogeneity challenge. Again, in this one is uh, whether the file system support multiple OSs. So I'm coming, I'm connecting with Windows OS. Uh, somebody else is connecting with uh, Linux OS. Somebody else may be connecting with the iOS um, OS. How does the system behave in that sense? And does it support all the OSs or it supports some of the operating systems? How does it work? Then the other challenge is the fault tolerance challenge, which is when the file system crashes, how does the client know about that? Or if the client crashes, how does the uh, file system react? Say like I mean you are writing to a file area and then the, the client crashes, now what happens? Um, to that, that's, that, does that area get recovered um, or is it just uh, all corrupted? How does how, what 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 happens there? Then the other one is consistency. Uh, consistency comes from um, the different clients um, when um, they access basically uh, the is the is that the the what each client looks at uh, from its perspective are they all in consistent view? Uh, so that's another thing basically that uh, we will talk about. And then the security is another concern. Uh, how do you authenticate a client or a user um, to a file system, and so that I mean he can only he can access? We saw like some of the high-level issues uh, regarding security in when we studied about uh, the Linux, basic Linux um, um, OS, uh, where we talked about um, the read-write access, read-write execute access. How how does that work? So here we will be that that challenge has been um, multiplied uh, pretty high, heavily. So we will look at that. And then finally, efficiency. Uh, how do we keep wastage of uh, the space to the minimum? So are there techniques that we can employ to do this? Uh, what do we do? So again, uh, as I mentioned, the Classical examples are the Sun NFS and the Android file system. Uh, so we will be learning about all these things. So before we go into that, let's look at the the the, the memory architecture, which is essentially um, we saw this uh, in the previous slide. So let's uh, look at it from the main memory onwards. So we are not looking at the caches and the, uh, the uh, inside it, whatever is inside the chip. So main memory, it's not 
share it's not a shared memory uh, mostly like it's local to that particular machine or that particular CPU um, and uh, the persistence it's not persistent so persistence is another property essentially for um, the the data whether then the process die whether the data still stays there or not so usually what happens is um, whatever the program that is running in a, in a process writes out the data into the hard disk so that the main memory is completely cleared of um, any of the uh, remnants of that uh, that particular process so uh, um, so so what that means is basically the main memory is not a persistent memory so we don't keep anything after the process gets uh, executed then by nature main memory is also similarly is a very local uh, localized memory so we don't keep any distributed cache or replica so that's also no uh, then the consistency maintenance um, again um, it tries to maintain the consistency and uh, the example uh, essentially but it says still a one copy consistency so that you cannot replicate that copy across multiple um, um, main memory systems here we will call it main memory systems uh, example is the RAM uh, or um, the DDR is another one so those kind of uh, things now let us look at file system file system again like uh, we do not allow the file system to share but it is persistent meaning um, the data gets written into that uh, file system after the process gets executed again I am uh, distinguishing between program and process that this is the distinction that we saw very early in the course. Um, which is essentially the process is a running instance of a program I, I hope you guys remember um, again the file system also does not um, uh, allow distributed or cache replicas because inherently like I mean this file system we are talking about is a file system within the computer so it is mainly for that particular machine. Again, consistency maintenance is a quickly like one copy consistency. Consistent. Now let's talk about the distributed file system. This is this is where it, it gets interesting. We allow sharing uh, in a distributed file system. The data is persistent, as we know, and then uh, it also allows the distributed cache, essentially, so that uh, you can create replicas of data all over the place. Um, and finally the consistency maintenance is uh, we will have um, multiple copies which um, um, essentially um, go through that consistency so we call it like approximate consistency um, so we know that I mean consistency is how each of the clients will view that particular files and here it is um, it's almost there essentially some of the new information may not be there in the, in the files but uh, pretty much like I mean the copies are updated on a periodic basis. So now let us look at a web server um, web server also allows you to share the data it is the data is persistent um, allow the distributed cache and replicas but there is no consistency. Essentially, like if something gets updated, um, everything is not looking at the same thing. So one data may be old, the other data may be new. Unless you hit like refresh, the data won't be updated. The distributed shared memory is another one. Um, so here again, we allow the share sharing of the memory, but the memory itself is not persistent. Uh, the way that we allow the memory is also through the distributed uh, cache and uh, replicas and then finally the consistency maintenance is also there um, remote objects essentially this is something that uh, the Corba supports um, and uh, again here sharing is done and then it is uh, just a one copy consistent so if you look at it I mean so the highest uh, one is probably the distributed file system. Um, and then there is also the peer to peer storage system 
which is also uh, very similar. Um, but the others are kind of they are lower in the hierarchy as you can see. Uh, the persistent object store and also the um, um, the remote objects um, from the core bar. So um, let's look at the the next uh, uh, picture. This uh, shows like a layered module architect module structure for the implementation of a non-distributed file system. Um, so here we have a directory module and then a file module, then the access control module, um, file access module, a block module, and a device module. So let's let's just uh, look at what each uh, the function of each of them. The directory modules is essentially like I mean that it has all the file handles um, that are in that particular directory. So this is um, the each of the file IDs. The file handles are also known as the file file ID. So essentially, the file names are related to the file IDs with using the directory module. The file module keeps uh, all the the file IDs and correspondingly like what is the file where is it located um, and um, all those details. The access control module is uh, the permission um, checker uh, we already know that there are three types of permission the read write and the execute so the access control module is the one that checks for these uh, permissions and whether certain operations are allowed or not allowed. The file access module that essentially um, is used to read and write file data um, or the attributes and the block module essentially like now accesses the, the file system or essentially the disk and that goes and allocates the blocks that are needed for this writing the file and then um, so basically like I mean um, the blocks are usually in chunks of some uh, number um, so that um, based on the file size uh, or estimated file size it allocates some blocks for that particular file uh, in the memory. And then the device module is essentially like I mean now that is uh, pretty much it, uh, it is the module that accesses the disk uh, does the IOs uh, and also like does the buffering. So whenever you are reading the file it um, takes the file ID essentially like I mean accesses uh, that particular disk and it gets the file for um, um, uh, the through the buffers it, it takes it through the buffers. So again the file systems um, essentially like I mean so that provides uh, the organization storage retrieval naming sharing and protection of all the files. So a file contains uh, the, the data and the attributes so now let us look at how the file records are uh, record structure uh, or how a file, file record structure look like. So the key things that we want to write are the file length and then it was created a creation timestamp um, if it is read multiple times or when was the last time it, re it is read that is a read time uh, timestamp after creation when if it is written again then the write timestamp and then there are some attribute timestamps um, and then the reference count. Um, and then there are some additional ones which is the owner the file type and then the access control list. So this is typically the record that is kept uh, as part of the file and um, we can actually access various uh, these various um, uh, parameters to get to where um, what the value is. 
so these are done through the operations essentially. Um, <coughs> so let's look at some of the operations. So here the operation is open. Open is uh, the name and then the mode. Um, so it basically opens an existing file with a given name and then assigns the file ID to file destination. Create is another operation uh, with the name and the mode, and this one creates the file with the name, and that that um, ID is assigned to the uh, file ID uh, file this. So the the mode can be like read write or read write, and then close the file destination or the file handle closes that particular file in any of the open files and then um, if it can close then it assigns the status as a 0 and um, if it cannot close then the status becomes 1 so based on the return value we can decide whether the file got closed or not and then the count essentially like I mean this is uh, actually like I mean the, the operation is the read operation read file this buffer n it uh, essentially transfers n bytes from the file to the buffer and um, essentially like we can also like measure that in the count now the write again file destination buffer n will uh, transfer the the file um, actually like I mean the the n number of bytes are transferred from buffer into the file that so these operations essentially like I mean they deliver the, the bytes um, and they also advance the read write pointer so the pointer is essentially like I mean what is uh, in the file so that uh, you know like I mean where exactly that is and then LC is uh, you give an offset and, a, and another uh, param called when uh, using this parameter it goes and um, moves the pointer the read write pointer to that offset. And then unlink essentially like removes the file name from the directory structure. If it has no other names, it it's just deleted. Otherwise, it's basically like it just uh, removes that name alone. The other names are kept. And link name one name two. Again, this adds a new name called name two to the file name one. And then the other one is the stat command. Um, this actually gets all the file attributes uh, we saw that here essentially in this one the attribute count and then the attribute time step so in all the attributes are um, it is taken and then put it in the buffer so we already saw like I mean so the requirements itself like I mean we know that these are the challenges and that is what we need. So um, let us look at um, the file service architecture this actually um, offers a clear separation of the main concerns in providing access to the files and it is obtained by structuring the file service into three components. So there is a flat file service a directory service and a client module service. So again this uh, the file service architecture um, is a way to organize the services that are associated with the files so that things are provided properly. So now let us look at the, the modules in the file service architecture. So imagine the server computer sitting 
somewhere far away and then they it's connected to the client using this uh, link which is essentially like some kind of the network and there may be like more clients sitting there uh, which are accessing the same um, data and um, essentially like I mean so um, when the client tries to access the flat file service essentially like I mean it just associated this and directly like I mean it, it collects the data and sends it to the client and um, it is almost like I mean you can think of uh, here the client computer is accessing just as a one on one with interacting with the file services. So there is a directory service and a file service and basically like the flat file service collects that file information and sends it to the client. So essentially in a flat file service all the, the files are assigned a unique file identifier or UFID. And um, so, since the files themselves are uh, uniquely named, it's easy to actually obtain what the file is. And uh, uh, essentially, like I mean, so one system that is accessing one of the files, um, the other systems may not be able to access that same thing. Every every file has a unique identifier, and the um, clients need to know that unique files identifier in order to access that one file. So the client, there is a client module that um, exports the interfaces by the flat file and uh, the directory store services from the server side. So the directory service itself, it's provided, uh, it provides the mapping between the text names of the files and their UFID. So the client may obtain the UFID of a file by coding its text name to the directory services. And these are all like one to one mapping like that. so so that that's the uniqueness of the flat file service which is not very interesting um, and um, as you can see actually the UFID can be a long sequence of bits because uh, it we need to map all the files in the file system um, with unique identifiers which is kind of um, an arduous ta task anyway. So the client module that is another piece of uh, uh, the services that we saw in this picture um, this runs on each computer and provides an integrated service or a flat file service because this service is pretty much constant or same across all the clients. So. Um, the client service in fact uh, in the Unix uh, side actually uh, emulates a full service full set of uh, Unix file operations these are the operations that we saw like earlier like open close and all those things all of the services are provided by the client module. Um, it also holds the information about the network locations of the flat file and then the directory server processes so that it can actually go to those uh, directory servers and access those files very easily. It achieves better performance through implementation of a cache of recently used file blocks at a client. So we can improve the performance of client module by having a cache, a local cache within that particular client um, in the system where we store the recently used file blocks. Again, the issue will be how do we maintain the consistency, and uh, so we will talk about that. So here are some of the um, again uh, commands that we can use: so the read field i comma n, uh, and then that goes into data, essentially. Like I mean, so it's a dash and arrow data. Um, here essentially like I mean we read a sequence uh, of one through length of file um, and the variable is i which is essentially like um, 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 
we increment that and then basically like when I mean, uh, and then uh, essentially like I mean that particular um, items are stored in data. Um, <coughs> the right field I data essentially it uh, um, writes a sequence of data into a file starting at item I and extending the, the file if necessary and create is another command that creates a new file with length 0 and delivers a UFID to the field uh, variable and delete field just remove that file from the file store get attributes field and then store we can store it into another uh, variable called attribute and then set attributes essentially like I mean that is uh, essentially like whichever attribute that you specify is set to that particular uh, field which is essentially the I mean sorry file ID which is the um, uh, the unique ID that uh, we have uh, found out. So again, um, the access control. Um, so in the distributed Im implementation, access write checks have to be performed at the server. Um, so it's not a client that provides the access control um, because the remote process control interface uh, is unprotected um, point of uh, access to to all these files essentially. So um, until you reach the server, basically like it's all unprotected, and then basically like so the, the access control itself is provided at the um, server side. Directory service interface um, essentially like in that we will look into it now. So here um, uh, there is a lookup uh, for particular directory with the name and that returns a file ID. Um, <coughs> and uh, if the name itself is not there in the um, in that particular directory then it throws an exception so that is the throws not found uh, field. The add name um, essentially like add the name um, and call the file into that particular directory uh, and if there is a already that name exists then it throws an exception. Unnamed directory name is uh, essentially like I mean if the name is in the directory then um, it is removed from the directory if it is not there in the directory then it throws an exception and then finally the get names directory with pattern um, get the text names in the directory uh, with a match of the regular expression pattern we will learn about regular expression in the, the future modules uh, in one of the programming modules. Uh, and then that is assigned to the main sequence essentially. So now we go to the the next file service architecture, which is a hierarchical file system. So right now we look at just the flat file, which is very easy to implement, um, very um, easy to access, but at the same time. You cannot do a lot of functionality there, um, and also you need to carry a long uh, unique file identifiers, which just causes issues um, by growing your directories and uh, uh, growing the client modules. Now let's go into the next one, which is the hierarchical uh, file system. This essentially, like I mean, uh, is uh, the file system where the the directories are now arranged in a tree essentially so essentially like you need to go into like various directories in order to figure out what is going on um, and then also the file group 
um, is another concept there where uh, it is a collection of files that can be located on any server or move between the servers while maintaining the same names. So we saw some of these uh, examples in when we originally like uh, started uh, Linux. Um, a similar construct is used in the in a Unix file system. It helps with distributing the the load of uh, file serving between the servers. Um, so essentially, like I mean, you can move the the file system or the file group to to be closer to where the client is asking for, so we can move to one of the servers. Um, also, the file groups have identifiers, uh, which are unique throughout the system. So that is that's the way that uh, it can be moved from one system to the other. So here is one method to construct a globally unique ID. Um, so we just use some attribute of the machine on which it is created so basically like the IP address so we know that IP address is a 32 bit uh, or a 4 octet um, uh, binary uh, we just add a date to it like so the IP address followed by date we call it as a unique identifier um, the date could be a date and time um, all the way to the second then the file gets created. So now we go into uh, the distributed file system. So again, uh, the three hierarchies that we talked about, uh, or the three different types of file system that we talked about: the flat files, the hierarchical files, and now we go into a distributed uh, file system. So here uh, we will talk about two main uh, file systems. One is the NFS or the Sun NFS. This is the this was developed by Sun Microsystems. In 1985, it's the uh, most popular and it's open uh, file system, and it's used uh, pretty much uh, uh, universally um, today. Um, also. Um, the NFS protocol itself is standardized through this particular standard is known as the RFC 1813. So the main idea is uh, here is basically the 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 server or the the file system itself is a stateless uh, system. So essentially, like I mean, the server itself is not required to remember anything, so it does not have anything uh, in the memory. Um, essentially the um, things like uh, which clients are connected which files are open things like that so essentially like I mean it just the file system itself is sitting in one place the um, clients basically are sent some requests essentially with all the information that are needed and then basically the server just fulfills the request and then this forgets the minute it fulfills the request and then moves on. So the onus is on the clients to provide all the information that are needed for accessing a file or essentially to provide that or to get that service. So the whole uh, so the advantage of this kind of a system is that the server state does not even does not grow with more number of clients so there is no change to the server itself which uh, you need to change the the number of uh, servers and then the other key idea of uh, nfs is um, when you perform an operation and if you are repeating the operation you get the same result there are no side effects so essentially like I mean if you say like A equal to um, B plus 1 um, and then um, essentially like every time you do the A basically like I mean it, it, it always um, it, 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 it you get only like A equal to B plus 1 or you do not get A equal to A plus 1 uh, where 
now the state of A is different. So that the next time you when you query it is a different answer. The second system that we will study is the AFS or the Andrew file system this is developed by the Carnegie Mellon University as a part of the Andrew distributed computing environments in 1986 so you can see that actually they are fairly close. Um, the, this research project was to create a campus wide file system. Um, and basically a public domain implementation is available on Unix it is called the Linux AFS. So this was again also um, adopted as a basis for the, the DFS system DFS file system in the open software foundation um, and uh, the distributed computing environment uh, group essentially. So let us look at uh, the NFS architecture the NFS architecture consists of uh, again the, the client computer but as I mentioned the client has a lot of onus on providing the data. Uh, so let us look at first the, uh, the server computer server computer has nothing but a virtual file system um, which has the which holds the Unix, uh, the Unix file system and then it has an NFS server. Um, which is another program that serves the various clients and then in uh, the client computer again like I mean you have the same kind of things there is a virtual file system which has the Unix file system and then whatever the extra ones here basically the blank ones are various devices slash dev and then there is also an NFS client the NFS client talks to the NFS server basically and provide the information as to what the files that it, it wants to retrieve or to write the um, write the content into that file uh, they all these programs actually like they all decide under the Linux or the Unix kernel. So the communication between the, the client and the server are using RPC what or what is known as the remote procedure calls essentially. Um, so the client itself basically it is a, it's a transparent access to the NFS file system so when you go through this NFS client to the NFS server uh, since it is stateless basically like it is as if like this is now connected together and there is no NFS server and NFS client and basically it is just you can transparently access whatever is inside the Unix file system the server side as well. So the client's job is essentially like I mean to um, um, basically provide this file system and also the transparent access to the NFS it also provides um, some virtual nodes essentially um, which is essentially like procedures for uh, procedures on an individual file or uh, um, it is an interface for procedures on an individual file. And then basically it translates that uh, the individual file uh, procedures into the various uh, NFS uh, remote procedure calls. So that way like I mean it can access the, the NFS server and retrieve that file. So here essentially like the application uh, program provides the Unix system calls through the Unix uh, kernel. And um, essentially, like I mean, the operations on so they they all the virtual file system just keeps all the operations as a local operation, so you won't feel that actually oh, there are some remote files also. Um, so from the application side, you are just calling a local program, but uh, the virtual file system 
identifies which is the local and which is the remote files and then the remote file is channel to the NFS client and then it provides uh, this RPC into the NFS server to retrieve that, uh, that file. So the file identifies we already introduced this concept of a file handle the file handle is uh, the file identifiers that are used in the the NFS itself. So here um, a particular file handle uh, denoted as FH uh, could be the file system identifier the the node number and then the I node generation itself. so all the all of them are combined together to get to the um, file handle. So the various um, um, commands are used here. Um, so in this one, there is a read operation. We again, like very similar to the flat file access, uh, we give the file handle or the file ID, the offset and the count, and then that uh, retrieves the data and then put it in the the data um, variable. The write. For writing basically we give again the file handle the offset the count and then the data um, and then basically like I mean it is written into the file system and then basically like there is an attribute that is written. The create uh, um, command essentially where we um, um, we specify a directory uh, file handle the name and then the attribute and um, this command returns a new file handle and also some attribute attribute on the file and then the remove um, remove actually is um, remove uh, just uh, returns the status essentially like whether it got removed or not again we give the just the directory uh, file handle and then the name file name the get attribute file handle gets the attribute related to that particular file uh, then the set will set that um, then there is a lookup command essentially which returns the file handle and then the attribute uh, rename command um, it is basically uh, the original name or the from directory file handle and the name to the two directory and then uh, to name link provides a link to the existing file and then the read there um, essentially uh, um, reads a particular uh, directory and then uh, returns all the values into this uh, variable entries. Sim link is a symbolic link, um, or a soft link, um, which ties um, a file to another and new name, um, and then that returns just the status. The read link uh, file handle, uh, essentially, like that returns a string, essentially. So um, it uh, um, gives just by gives the expanded. Um, um, Link path. Make there is uh, it creates a new directory, and um, for that it gives you the new file handle and then that is. And then rm there basically removes a directory, and then uh, stat file system uh, file handle gives the file system status. Essentially. So these are some of the commands that are used in the Sun NFS, uh, which is one of the very popular system. So now let's look at uh, some of the other um, uh, features of uh, Sun NFS. Uh, in fact, we learned about this one. One is the, the security, or how do we make sure that uh, there is an access control and authentication. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, the NFS server itself is a stateless server, which means that the user's identity, access rights, all of them are controlled. Um, 
by the server only on uh, the request and uh, essentially um, the client is uh, um, so the local file system they are checked only on the files access permission attribute um, so essentially like I mean this is uh, we, we have to check every time whenever we access the, the, the file system. So it does not remember like I mean a particular user is authenticated or not. So every time you need to check again and again. Um, also, the client request is accompanied by a user ID and a group ID. Um, these are inserted by the RPC, the, the remote procedure call. Um, we talked about this also like earlier, like in this uh, example, where um, the virtual file system converts or basically like it forwards the remote access to the NSS client which converts the file handle into the particular remote procedure call which contains these additional data uh, which is the user ID and the group ID and then then it uh, sends it to the uh, the file system to gather that file. So the Kerberos is also it has been introduced it has been integrated with uh, NFS and uh, that provides a stronger and uh, much more comprehensive security. So now let's look at. Um, the mount service um, mount service is used to uh, mount a particular disk into the file system. So if it is a new disk, we use the mount function to uh, do this uh, to mount the uh, the remote files. So the operation is mount remote host remote directory and the local directory. So um, it basically like um, Mounts that file system into the, the local directory. So, in this uh, example, the server maintains the table of clients, um, whichever once mounted the file system sent it to them. Each client maintains a table of mounted file systems. Holding the IP address, the port number, and then the file handle. The remote file systems may be hard mounted, mounted or soft mounted in a client computer, very similar to the soft link or hard link. So, here uh, another example where it uh, shows the two remotely mounted files. So in the server there is a directory called people which contains like big John and Bob in the client side there is a directory called user which has students which are remotely mounted on people and then there is also another directory called staff which is a remotely mounted on staff in actually in, in users in server 2. Then there is also a concept of auto monitor. Uh, the auto monitor was added to the Unix implementation of uh, NFS in order to mount a remote directory dynamically whenever an empty mount point is referenced by a client. So this is kind of uh, if the client asks for a um, particular node which is uh, empty by default, then the auto monitor automatically mounts um, the the particular remote uh, directory there. So again, the auto monitor has a table of mount points with the reference to one or more NFS servers uh, listed against each. So it sends first a probe message to the each candidate server, 
um, to see whether the particular uh, mount point is still available then it uses the mount point uh, to mount the file systems and then uh, serve the appointment and uh, usually the auto mounter keeps the mount table to be very small. So this also provides a form of replication for uh, read only files. So let us look at the caching essentially like I mean so um, caching can be in of two forms one is a server side caching and then also the other one is the client side caching. Uh, before we go into the server side caching let us look at the client side caching. The caching always is um, it provides improved performance because um, certain blocks if you cache and basically those are the frequently used blocks and if the client requests that every time the cache can provide uh, very quick access to that uh, particular block so that uh, the system that is requesting that is not starving for data. So for reads essentially like I mean so the always the the protocol from the client side is checks with the local cache before goes into the server because whenever we go into servers it can take longer time whereas the local cache will be easier so only if there is a cache miss it goes to the server but at the same time writes basically um, you can the most uh, or the sun nfs itself provides a periodic write back and not an immediate write back to the server um, mainly the the reason is uh, we do not want to contact server that often because that can slow down the communication network um, So the client caches two types of data the one is the data block itself and then the other one is the attributes. Now let us look at the server caching basically so uh, the server caching is very similar to the Unix file caching in the local form. So the various uh, blocks from the disk they are held in the main memory buffer cache until the space is uh, required for new pages. The read ahead and the delayed write um, optimizations are also possible. So, um, what this means is basically uh, so if you know that actually you are reading it from one particular file, instead of getting the portions that are in the read operation, you get more thinking that maybe like I mean you can read ahead of time itself. And then um, delayed write is essentially like I mean so you delay the write with uh, either the various uh, cache consistency protocols um, and so that um, um, we can further optimize the overall uh, uh, caching mechanism. Uh, for the local files the writes are deferred to the next sync event so this is again the delayed write uh, principle. So 30 second interval is when like the sync event happens. Um, it the way I mean the Sun NFS works very well with the local context where files are always active through the local cache. But in a remote ca ca case, the synchronization like it doesn't guarantee the necessary synchronization um, to the clients. So the NFS uh, version 3 servers uh, offers two strategies for updating the disk one is the write through and then the other one is the delayed commit. I think like you already know about this when we if you had studied the cache coherency protocol how to maintain coherency in a cache whereas the write through is essentially like when you are writing it both in the cache as well as in the main file. Uh, in this case essentially like I mean for the the altered pages are written into the disk as soon as they are received uh, at the server. So then the other one is the delayed commit uh, whereas um, the 
pages are held in a cache until a commit signal arrives and then basically uh, at that point uh, the, the file system itself is written with the new data. So we, we looked at this one basically this plant uh, caching. Um, so again the, the client caches the results from uh, the read, write, get attribute, lookup and then the read the operations. Um, the synchronization is uh, not guaranteed uh, when two or more clients are sharing the same files. So that is uh, something that we pay the penalty for. Then the validity itself is checked through a timestamp based check um, essentially like it reduces the inconsistency but it does not eliminate it. So it is used for the validity condition for cache entries at the client. So the formula is like T which is the current time minus T C which is the time when the cache entry was last validated must be less than T which is the freshness guarantee. So we do not want excessive time pass between these two events to do anything kind of thing um, and then essentially the TM client is the time when the block was last updated at the server and then basically uh, uh, TM, uh, TM server is essentially like then so actually TM client is the time when the block was last updated at the client. And then the same thing is when it was updated at the server. TC is the time when the cache entry was last validated. So, um, so basically, like I mean, we need to make sure that um, this is the validity condition that is um, satisfied um, for the cache entries. So, in the previous one, the the T itself is. Um, It's the freshness guarantee um, that can be customized, so you can decide what that value should be, uh, and then based on that, uh, we can construct uh, um, the 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 rules. Uh, so the t is set between like three seconds to thirty seconds. Also it remains uh, difficult to write distributed applications uh, that uh, share files with the NFS itself. So one other question that may come up is um, how do we maintain uh, the how do we update or how, how how does client update the server? So for files, essentially, like I mean, we can do the write back from the client cache to the server, uh, and then we can decide that interval as thirty seconds. Um, also, like there are uh, commands called flush on close, which is essentially um, um, it takes uh, the the memory reads and writes. And then push it into the file system automatically. For the directory, is essentially like we just incrementally write to a server. So, as an example, we can say, like okay, the client X and Y, um, they have a file name called A that is cached, and then the file name A occupies the block one, two, and three. So now um, the clients X and Y both can open A and then X writes uh, to the blocks 1 and 2 and then uh, client Y actually like now um, it writes to the block and one, block 1 and 30 seconds later what happens the client Y reads block 2 uh, and 40 seconds later the client Y reads block 1. 
so again like I mean, this is one scenario like I mean, there you can find out how system will behave so the performance itself is another another parameter or um, another concern that we talk about um so the right operations is only like i mean responsible of 5% of the server calls in a typical unix environment the lookup accounts for 50% operations because um step by step path name resolution is necessitated by the naming and then the mounting semantics so the recent measurements show a higher performance of uh, the sun nfs um and then the last measurement was taken in 1993 so in summary uh, nfs is an excellent example of a very simple but a robust high performance distributed service or distributed file system um so the access transparency essentially like i mean so the, uh, the same unix uh, call um, is uh, or the unix call itself is uh, same for both local and remote files so that is one of the things we talked about in the, the transparency so let's look at those uh, the transparency in detail so the location transparency the naming of the file systems is controlled by the client mounting operations but the transparency can be ensured by the appropriate system configuration so even though like i mean the client actually controls the mount uh, operations and how to name the files um the transparency can be controlled if you actually configure the system with the appropriate information or uniqueness in the mount point the mobility trans, uh, transparency essentially which means that uh, when the system is uh, changed from one to one to the other how do we ensure the transparency uh, transparency this is not achieved at all um and uh, relocating the files is not possible and uh, only the file systems are possible but that requires an update to the client configuration because clients are the ones deciding everything about the this particular file system the file system itself is memory less and then the scalability transparency essentially like i mean so again this one um we can subdivide the file system uh, and allocate and uh, we can allocate uh, separate servers for each of the file system so that way like i mean we can scale the system but uh, it's also depends the performance itself is determined by the load on the server holding the most heavily used uh, file system replication is another one um so so for replication um since we do a, a limited uh, only we limit this file system to read only file systems um basically the replication transfer system so for writable files the sun network information service or the nis run over nfs and uh, that's used to replicate essential systems the hardware software operating system heterogeneity um again the nfs has been implemented for almost um, every known operating system and hardware platform um and that is supported by a variety of uh, filing systems or filing systems fault tolerance uh, it's limited but effective so service is suspended if the server fails recovery from failures is aided by a simple stateless design and efficiency basically it can be uh, implemented for use in situations that generate a very heavy loads so the next case study will be the andrews uh, file system um before we go into that uh, um also want to talk about a uh, little bit on the um the sun uh, nfs file system so the key takeaways that you want to take away are um, number one is it's a stateless server um and then 
the operations themselves are what is known as the idempotent operations. Um, so what I mean is here. So um, yeah, and then the other takeaway uh, is um, also the the client uh, can, so um, So yeah, so the the item put in, uh, server operation is essentially like I mean, so when you repeat an operation, it does not have any side effects. So um, it also helps with the the various other uh, things, basically like uh, the fault tolerance, the scalable performance, the consistency. They are all addressed in the um, NFS system. Um, and then uh, one thing to note is uh, when particular uh, system crashes, it tends to slow the uh, other the server to the other clients, the clients that are uh, there. Um, so this is kind of one of the drawbacks of the system. You can think of it. Um, and then the client also like needs to cache um, the data for scalable performance. Not just the server alone needs to cache. In fact, when server caches, sometimes it is not meaningful. And um, since we put a cache in the uh, client side, uh, the data consistency is extremely hard because now we don't know like which copy is the latest one because there is some other copy that is uh, still sitting in the uh, process itself. So that's all I have for today. We will continue from this point uh, next week. Uh, then we'll do the next uh, class. Uh, thank you very much. Sandeep.